Welcome back to Rome Boys. On this episode, we welcome to the program Father Dwight Longnecker. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that right, Father? Uh, you forgot a syllable. It's Longenecker. Longenecker. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good. Awesome to have long. you on. Yeah. Thank this you is... for joining us, Father. Uh, so, you know, the whole world knows about us, but they need to know about Shh. you. No, I'm kidding. Not. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. But will you, will you share with the audience a little bit about yourself, please? Because we're excited to have you on, and it's, and it's been a long time coming. Well, I was brought up in an evangelical Protestant home in Pennsylvania, um, and uh, after high school, I went to Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina, which is not known as a Catholic school, okay, <laughs> yeah. very anti-Catholic, okay. Uh, while I was there, I became an Anglican uh, and got a severe dose of an illness called Anglophilia, the love of all things English. So, when the opportunity, I was reading C.S. Lewis and T.S. Eliot and all these great writers, and so when the opportunity came to go and study in England, uh, for theolo theology in order to be an Anglican priest, off I went uh, to live in England and study there and become ordained into the Anglican Church. Uh, I was then serving in the Anglican Church as an Anglican priest for 15 years before finally coming out of communion with the Catholic Church in England. And then after 10 years as a Catholic layman, um, the door opened for me to come back to the U.S. and be ordained as a Catholic priest, although I have a wife and four children, um, through the what's called the pastoral provision. That's a special um, provision set up by Rome for, for former uh, people or Anglican, sometimes Lutheran clergy who come into the Catholic Church um, who are already ordained, already married, but Rome gives us a dispensation from the vow of celibacy, allowing us to be ordained as married, as to ordained as Catholic priests. So I then wow. came with my family back to the U.S., to see, uh, Greenville, South Carolina, where I was ordained as a Catholic priest and served as the pastor of Our Lady of the Rosary Church in Greenville. Excellent. Wow. That's the short version. Yeah. That's the yeah. short version. And you've written a bunch of books? Yeah, about 20. Okay. Excellent. So what, what happened, what did you do uh, during your lay period? Hmm. About 15 years. Yeah. I wrote books uh, and articles, and uh, I'd always wanted to be a writer, so that I had the time to um, start doing some writing. But I was also working part-time uh, for a little Catholic charity that raised money and helped convert clergy. So I would go around the different parishes every weekend and uh, speak about our work and, and pass the hat. So that was my job. <laughs> wow. Nice. Very good. Yes. Very good. Still and you were in the Holy Land for two months recently. Yeah, I've come for a sabbatical in the Holy Lands where I was in Jerusalem for two months doing some research. Wow. Wow. What an experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are, are, is there going to be a point where you're going to share that research with us? Yeah. Uh, while I was there, I wrote a little book called The Secret of the Bethlehem Shepherds, which comes out in, uh, for, in time for Christmas this year. Awesome. Oh, wow. Cool. So cool. Cool, cool. Yeah. Okay. I don't work on, I'd already written a book about the Magi, the, the wise men, mm -hmm. called The Mystery of the Magi. And so I thought I would follow it up with a little book on the shepherds. And uh, Magi, the Magi are, as you know, are, that story is told in Matthew's gospel. And the shepherds are in Luke's gospel. So I went back into Luke's gospel to look at the infancy and the Christmas story uh, and produce a little book about that. Oh, wow. So cool. Awesome. Yeah, so cool that's stuff. great. I'd love to see. Thanks uh, for, uh, telling us about that time because you still stayed dedicated to the faith. And even in the space that you were in, you knew the situation that you were going through and were able to help others. That's awesome. Does that charity still exist? Yeah. Uh, those ten, those, oh, yeah. It's called the St. Barnabas Society in England. It's a little bit like Marcus Grody's Coming Home Network. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that is helping converts into the church. Um, yeah, those 10 years were difficult because I knew I was supposed to be a priest, but the door was not opening. Mm. The church was just kind of yeah. marginalizing me a little bit. Um, but I've written all this up in a, another book that's about to come out next year, I hope, which is called There and Back Again. It's my conversion story slash autobiography. Awesome. Wow. Hey, people love, I love the title. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, well, I, you might recognize it. Yeah. I, 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 I tend to steal stuff from my favorite authors. So, um, <laughs> C.S. Lewis kind of borrowing the title. They're, there. 
He doesn't. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually um, that's actually J.R. Tolkien. Uh, oh, that's right. They're, in, they're back at the Hobbit. Yeah, that's right. They're yeah. back again as the Hobbit. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, that's great. I real I realize, of course, that they're in back again. It's a story of going from America to England and then back again, of course. Mm-hmm. But I realize if that's the case, that it makes America to be the Shire and England to be Mordor, which <laughs> the English will not. The English will not be really very happy about. But that's um, great. There. You said it, not us. Just <laughs> yeah. for the record. Yep, you can. <laughs> so I gotta. I, I'm sure you've been asked this before, um, but man, you probably give some pretty good uh, advice in the confessional when it comes to uh, giving men. You know, uh, marriage advice for their confessions. Yeah, you have a unique perspective. Well, it cuts both. It cuts both ways. I've had one or two people say I could never go to him in confession um, because he's a married man. But more people than that say I'm glad to go to Father Longenecker for confession because he understands what it's like to have be a married life. Yeah. In what? I don't ways? claim to be an expert. Who can? Yeah. yeah. Who, who could? Yeah. Who can? Nobody can. No. It's. Uh, Man, I've got so many questions. But I, don't I, I met a Catholic priest before that was married. He said it was the hardest job in the world. Would you what, being married or being a Catholic priest? Well, <laughs> the, the both and. I mean, you're both. You, I mean, you're dedicated to your wife and your children and then the priesthood. And I, and I understand your kids are probably raised now. but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting question. And in fact, I know of no study or no theological study that is actually considered these two sacraments, which are called the sacraments of service, holy matrimony and holy orders to see how to actually be complementary rather than contradictory. Mm. Um, and in my life, my family life, my marriage, um, and my hopefully giving myself to my children and my wife complements and helps and sheds light on my priestly vocation. Yeah. And I think, I think it's possible that it does so without actually necessarily being a clash. Of course, historically it's been seen as a clash mm-hmm. that you can't do both. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank you for taking on the, yeah. you know, the both roles. Gosh, yeah. I mean, you're, mm-hmm. what an example. Mm-hmm. And I always give credit to my wife as well, because she's just rolled with this and gone with it. I mean, how many women are married to a Catholic priest, you know? Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> very few. Yeah. She has a problem. Very small, very small. And she's, she's done a great, she's done a wonderful job just rolling with it. She has her own business. She has her own uh, yeah. level, you know, her own life in that way. So mm-hmm. it's good. not like she's um, tied to my my vocation. She has um, a life of her own in a way, which yeah. I think is healthy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you could cool. probably give some deacons some good advice, right? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, we live. Well, she could too. I mean, <laughs> phrase all the time. We live in a post-Christian society. Okay, that's obvious, but isn't it worse than that? I mean, see, out there, it's pretty crazy. Well, what do you have if it's post-Christian? Mm. You have either neo-paganism or you have atheism. And really, that's what we have now. We have a, we have a blend of neo-paganism and atheism. Mm. And the neo-paganism shows itself with the kind of crazy ideologies that people are following as false religions. Um, but the atheism is written into our almost the genetic code of our modern society. And this is the topic of my book, Beheading Hydra. Um, a radical plan for Christians in an atheistic age. And, and you get into it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. There is so much. But I appreciate as you go through the book, you see all the negatives that are out there, but you have a battle plan, which we'll get to later in the interview, but a battle plan of how to counteract it. Because we hear all the negative news or whatever is politics, pick your thing, and we don't know what to do as lay people or even as clergy. So, yeah, I appreciate right. that. <clears throat> Hence well, beheading. The, there you go. Let's behead the beast. The book actually in different. The book actually lays out sixteen different isms, which I hope helps people to see the problems clearly, see where they came from, and to be able to analyze them when they when they crop up because they come to us uh, through the social media, through television, through films, through advertising. They're they're like the air we breathe. They're coming at us all the time, mm-hmm. and these this book helps people to actually spot them and understand them and see where they came from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so true. Very true. So how has indifferentism mm-hmm. snuck into Christianity, particularly into Catholicism? Mm-hmm. And what is indifferentism? Indifferentism is basically the idea that uh, it doesn't really religion you follow. And it's expressed in things like, you know, we're all climbing the same mountain, but we're all just on different paths. You know, stuff right, like that. Right, right. Where people will say, 
We say, as long as you're spiritual, as long as you're following your own heart and your own spirituality, you will eventually reach um, the Godhead or whatever. Sure. And in, in, usually um, combined with universalism. Universalism is the belief that everybody will be saved in the end. As long as they mean well, you know, they'll be all right. They'll get into heaven. So indifferentism and universalism are pretty much bedfellows. They go together. What do you say to priests that are at a funeral and they basically canonize the person and say, they're going to heaven, no worries. Uh, I, oh, I just get frustrated by that. What do you say? It's not up to me to, uh, to, to correct him, actually. It's above my pay grade. <laughs> but I can tell you what I do. Yeah. Okay. We, when we prepare the families for a, for a Catholic funeral, we say, this is not a memorial service for your loved one. Mm. This is not a time for eulogy. If you're having um, a service, a rosary before the funeral, you may have a eulogy there or in the funeral home beforehand. Have That's the place for the eulogy where you can talk about your loved one. But the funeral service, if it's a mass, is a Catholic act of worship in which we're offering the mass for the repose of the soul of your loved one. This is a memorial service. Um, and they're usually very grateful for that. And we try to do our celebrate the masses with real reverence and beautiful music and great solemnity. And in a day when a lot of denominations don't have funerals at all, all they have is memorial services, people will come to our funeral service and said, whoa, that was really beautiful, you know, thank you. And so I think if we keep to the Catholic faith uh, in our own practice, that should be a corrective to others who are a bit confused about these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you did a, a show with uh, Mass of the Ages and uh, talked about the Concilium and, and all of those changes. And so one of the questions that I really appreciate that they asked you was, what does your Mass look like at your home parish? Well, when I came to the parish, we were worshiping in a former, really just a warehouse building, a cheap warehouse type building. And for 50 years, the people have been trying to build a new church. Hmm. And so when I came, they said, Father, you're the one to build the new church. I said, okay, let's go. I was a new priest. I'd never been a Catholic priest before. I didn't really know what I was biting off, but it was something that we did together. And we built a beautiful new church in Greenville, South Carolina, in a traditional Romanesque style. And if people are interested, they, could, they can go to olrgreenville.com. There's an online tour of the church where they can actually see the beautiful new church building. Oh, cool. So that's important. The building itself is important. But our worship also is uh, the Novus Ordo Mass, but celebrated in a reverent way uh, with f fine music as much as we can manage with um, well-trained altar boys, uh, and with a real emphasis on reverence in the worship. Are there some key components that you really focus on uh, for, those, uh, for that reverence? Well, you know, it's something which we all do together. The people, when they come to Mass, are intent on worshiping and reverence. So their reverence actually is part of what we're doing as we celebrate the Mass. One of the things we do is we celebrate the Mass at Orientum, um, in which the priest is facing the same direction as the people and praying with the people and offering the sacrifice up on behalf of the people and with the people and for the people. Now, people sometimes say, well, you're turning your back to the people. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, actually, no, what I'm doing is I'm praying more intimately with the people. Mm -hmm. We're all facing the same direction, offering the mass together as the priest offers the sacrifice of the mass. And I think that's an important um, element. An increasing number of our people receive communion kneeling and on the tongue, and we don't impose that on everybody all that and encourage that. So this is another element which brings real reverence to the Mass. And our ch what is beautiful in our Mass is we have a lot of really young families with lots of children. Hmm. And it's beautiful to see how the children and the young people love to worship in a reverent manner. Our altar boys and our girls in the choir, they're ex the reverence. And I say to them, look, I say to a young 15-year-old boy, when you come and kneel to receive communion on the tongue, I said, you are inspiring everybody else who's here. So please continue to do that because your example is beautiful and people love to see that. And I say to my altar boys, when you process in for the processional hymn and you move solemnly with a good posture and reverence, our people love to see that. And I can see that because the people are turning around to watch these beautiful boys come in in, in that way. And they love them. They're their children as well. They belong to all of us. They're parish children. So all of these elements actually contribute to the reverent mass. That's exciting Let's to hear. visit, guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds, sounds amazing. Fun. Yeah, I hear Greenville's nice in the yeah. winter. <laughs> most, Sunday <morning. laughs> most Sunday mornings at 1030, we have between 12 and 15 altar boys. Wow. wow. 
that's incredible. That's cool. That's awesome. And that's a they run in. They run in the morning, saying, "Father, can I serve this morning?" I say, "Yeah, sure. Get your cassock on. Let's go." <laughs> wow. Would yeah. you say that this is that the way y'all are performing? I would you say performing mass yeah. or uh, saying mass? Celebrating. Is, would it be celebrating. Celebrating mass. Thank you. Would it be more in line with what Vatican II actually had in mind? In my opinion, yes. Um, I think Vatican the, the the changes that have come as a result of the Vatican Second Vatican Council have very often been a case of the clergy sort of being given an inch and taking a mile. Um, now there are there are a lot of people who are really down on the Second Vatican Council, and I like to put this in context and say, you know, the Second Vatican Council was a genuine attempt to make the Mass and to make our Catholic worship relevant and real and connect with people. Um, you know, after decades of the Latin Mass, which many people remember that it was just going through the motions. It felt like Father was coming in and rattling through the Latin as fast as he could, uh, and there was no real connection. A lot of the priests and the liturgists in the 1960s and 70s said, here's the opportunity we have at last to help our Catholics really connect with God and really connect with the Lord and really connect with their faith. Now, a lot of the things they did as a consequence, in my opinion, were misguided and, and lacking real judgment. So instead of helping them to connect with their tradition, they tended to adopt some of the music and some of the customs of the age, and some of the music and the customs of Protestantism, uh, and therefore watered down the strength and the vigor of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for but the point I'm making is that they that they were well intentioned, and what they wanted to do was something good. They wanted our people to connect with the faith. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. The, the intention was there, but the implement implementation. Didn't it, was, was, it was very often misguided. Mm -hmm. often yeah, misguided. it seemed like it's coming back, you know, with priests like yourself and, that and really, are trying our best to, yeah, get it to be where the the council fathers wished and uh, prayed. Yeah. So I know you're busy. So to take on the uh, the uh, the challenge of writing a book, uh, <clears throat> uh, beheading Hydra. Obviously, there's things in the culture that you see that you want to get out there, but. Uh, was there something like the thought, like, you know what, I need to write a book about this? Was there something that inspired you specifically? Yeah, uh, I was actually writing another book at the time, which was called Immortal Combat. Yeah. And Immortal Combat is the one right before this. And the idea of Immortal Combat was I was going to set up problems in society and show how the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ answers those problems. Mm -hmm. But as I began to set up the problems in society, I began to realize that actually there's a, this is another book. <laughs> so I went back to I went back to the publishers and said, "Look, there's two books here, not one." So luckily, the good folks at Sophia Institute Press said, hey, "Go for it, Father." <laughs> awesome. So we finished a more combat, which I would recommend, and then went on to and then finished Beheading Hydra. Gotcha. Yeah, you're, you're like a book factory. <laughs> I mean, just, just spitting them out left and left and right. That's great. Yeah, I'm just starting another one, which is called <laughs> Angels Crashing: A Brief History of Transcendence. Oh wow. wow! Goodness gracious! You're nailing those titles. I mean, really? Yeah, <laughs> love it. <laughs> so, as you uh, were in Jerusalem on sabbatical for two months, you come back. How has that inspired you? Uh, obviously, you're writing a book, but uh, and you wrote a book there. Uh, but w in your homilies and in your parish life, well, we uh, visit Jerusalem even for a short time. Uh, it's what really impresses you is the fact of the incarnation. When you go to the Holy Land, which they sometimes call the fifth gospel, when you go to the Holy Land, that verse when Jesus says, you know, even the rocks and stones would cry out. If uh, yeah. It's like the rocks and the stones are crying out because you're walking through the streets of old Jerusalem. You're saying, here is the place where he walked. This is the place where he was crucified. You worship in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the archaeology has shown that this really is the place where our Lord was crucified and buried and rose again. Now, Incredible. I was there for Holy Week this year, so imagine standing at the place where almost certainly St. Mary Magdalene met the Lord on Easter morning, mm. and you're there on Easter morning. Whoa, it just is, it's just mind-blowing. Yeah. I will never forget it. Mm. On the third Sunday of Easter, I went back to the Church of Holy Sepulchre to con celebrate Mass, and I didn't realize this, but the Mass would be celebrated actually in the empty tomb. Mm. Wow. So, I was there to celebrate Mass with a friend, one of the Franciscans, and to say Mass in the empty tomb was just awesome, you oh. know, just un unforgettable. That's incredible. Uh, yes. Talk about yeah. bucket list 
check mark. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chills. Just thinking about yeah. that one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was yeah. so cool. And there's not much room in there. So, yeah, to have them, to be able to. No, it was just what happened was outside the holy, the, whole, the uh, edicule outside the empty tomb uh, in front of it is where they had set up for the ministry of the oh. word and where the congregation were seated. And then for the and then for the ministry of the Eucharist, the priest, the other priest and I went into the edicule, into the empty tomb and celebrated the mass there on the actually altar where our Lord lay. Oh, wow. oh my goodness wow. gracious. That's, yeah. so, and that was, if you're familiar with the Eastern Rite Liturgy, where they have the iconostasis, and the priest goes behind through the iconostasis mm -hmm. to celebrate Mass on an altar behind there, it was kind of like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. That's so okay. whenever I go into an Eastern church again, I see the iconostasis, uh -huh. and I see this place behind the iconostasis, and that's kind of like the nice. Yeah. It's awesome. That's amazing. Wow. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's very vivid to me. We just saw the Jesus play in Branson, Missouri, which kind of brings it alive, you know, the story of the Great Commission and so forth. And to hear this, it's, it's just awesome. Uh, what a bucket list item. We've, mm. we've uh, been talking about doing a trip to Italy yeah. and Rome. And, and so, eventually the Holy Land, for sure. God willing. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're definitely kind of nudging us. You're inspiring us. us. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Ooh. awesome. Awesome. So you spend time uh, blogging and podcasting? Uh, I don't podcast so much. I produced, I used the podcast mechanism to produce a series of what I podcast, but they're really sort of audio lectures and audio recordings. So for instance, I recorded um, uh, Hilaire, and I edited down and recorded a version of Hilaire Bullock's Characters of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. I did a 23-part series on the history of the church called Triumphs and Tragedies. Mm -hmm. And these are available on my blog. So this is a weekly podcast, but it's using the podcast mechanism to be able to, you know, get the word out there. Yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah, we, You are a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, you know, we asked a couple of questions about society. And one of the books that we enjoy is um, uh, Apostolic Mission. Yeah, from to, Christendom from, to Apostolic. From Christ yeah, yeah. yeah, from Christendom to Apostolic Mission. Are you familiar with the book? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. Yeah, so hmm. it's, it sounds like a lot of what you've kind of presented to your audience and readers is uh, we're in a different mode, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we're not in Christendom anymore. Uh, and Pope Francis said that to the Roman Curia, you know, mm -hmm. right out of the gate. Uh, we are no longer in a Christian society. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we try to do is bring hope. And uh, we talked about joy, you know, and uh, before we came on the show here. Uh, what is some hope that you can share with our audience? Well, I have great hope. I, I, one of my, um, it's not a favorite book, but one of the books that's helped me a lot is um, a book written in 2009 by John Allen. It's called Future Church. Hmm. And John Allen is a very respected journalist working in Rome. Uh, and he did all the research the demographics um, and the research on what the future looks like um, in 2009. So we're already, of course, a good decade into his predictions. And he takes secular data uh, on demographics and population growth and so forth, and then reflects on that, on how it affects the Catholic Church. And he gives a lot of information about the future of the Catholic Church. And to sum it up, it's fair to say the future of the Catholic Church is African and Asian. And although the Catholic Church and the Christian Church is dwindling in its influence in the West, the churches in Africa and Asia are experiencing persecution and hardship, but also keep producing a joyful spirit. And a seminaries are full, the religious houses are full, um, and that gives me great hope for the future. What's interesting also about the African Church is that the African Church has gone from a time of uh, paganism and primitivism to the Christian faith through the evangelization efforts in the 19th century of uh, the colonial powers, and they have gone straight from primitive and pagan to Christian without the intervening period of uh, Christendom and the Enlightenment. Uh, it's, the enlightenment it's the Enlightenment period, of course, which has given us 21st century Westerners this doubt about the supernatural, the doubt about faith, about God, the existence of God. And the Africans haven't gone through that. They've gone through, they've gone from a paganism and primitivism, primitivism, which actually had a strong belief in the supernatural, straight into Christianity. So what we see in African Christianity is much more like what we would have seen in the first ages of the Christian church. 
when the Roman and Greek civilizations were moving from paganism to Christianity. So this historically is actually a very interesting phenomenon, which very few people have commented on, which yeah. I find very inspiring, hopeful. This is awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't, I mean, we've talked about how where there's persecution, there's growth yeah. in yeah. the church. Sure. That's always uh, happened throughout history. Through persecution to, in history, the church has always grown. Yeah. So the African church will typically, for instance, be, uh, very strong on the supernatural, on the belief in miracles and exorcism and the supernat and the sacraments and the supernatural aspect of the faith. Um, they'll have a strong belief in the Bible and in the need for evangelization. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they're likely to be a little bit, shall we say, leftish economically and socially because they're, they're poor and they realize the need for justice and peace. And so a lot of American conservative Christians might say, oh, yeah, I like the conservative morality. I like the supernatural. I like the traditional, but not too sure about what smells like socialism to me. Mm, right, when sure. in fact, the African church is really just making an emphasis, a, a good emphasis, I think, on the need for the Christian church to also be involved in peace and justice uh, uh, economically and socially. You know, it's interesting. I was going to ask the next question, which you basically answered, but uh, you know, I hear a lot of people come to us and come to me and say uh, that they don't often think that they understand the that American Enlightenment phase of our history. And so uh, there may be a disconnect from the priest to the congregation or the parishioners. Is there anything that uh, that is being done for that? Well, I don't want to push my book too much, but, you know, yeah, beheading yeah. Hydra... Beheading Hydra actually deals with this because I discussed the fact that for the last 500 years, um, we have gone through a period of what I call the Age of Revolution. And this began with the Revolution, and it went through the, to the Enlightenment Revolution, the French Revolution, um, and the Scientific Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, the Sexual Revolution, and now the Technological Revolution. And that we are living at the result and the end point of 500 years of revolution. And this revolution has really taken the Christian faith and the Catholic Church right upside down. So we're living in a very tumultuous time and a time where we need to put our roots deep into the past and into our tradition in order to stand firm. Well, God will have the final revolution. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so what is the battle plan for defeating Hydra? I mean, we call Captain America or, I mean... <laughs> well, well, you know, down through the last these last 500 years of revolution, the Church has responded... Um, in three different ways. One has been uh, a counterattack in which the theologians and the, and the fathers of the church have basically tried to launch an attack against the Enlightenment, against modernism, and against liberalism, doing things like putting banning books, um, making people sign, you know, statements of loyalties to the faith and so forth, and actually persecuting those who were liberals, liberals and modernists. And in fact, that doesn't work. All that happens is they, they go underground, they, come, they retreat, and they get stronger. The second approach has been um, to compromise and to uh, engage in dialogue and to accompany the liberals and the modernists and to say, well, what can we learn from them? We need to listen to them. We need to accompany them. We need to approach. We need to walk with them and learn from them so that we can share together what we have in common. Well, all that does is weakens the faith. The third reaction is actually what I call um, uh, radical subversion. And to live the Christian faith in a radical, simple way, simply doing what we're supposed to do. To us to love our Lord, to love the Blessed Virgin, to love the sacraments, and to love the poor, and to live that Christian Catholic faith in a clear, uncompromising, radical way, just where we are in our parishes, in our families, doing what we can with what we have where we are, doing what you guys are doing, starting up a podcast, starting up a ministry, starting up a men's group, starting up a school, getting on and living this faith. And that in itself is the greatest witness and counter to the things which attack the faith. That's why in the book I say, look, I'm not teaching anything new here. I'm simply saying, let's get on and do what we should be doing. And I lay that out in, in I don't know, 10 more chapters on how to do that. Mm -hmm. Why it's, reinvent the wheel? Stick to the basics. It's so simple. But There's, the devil complicates because things. The th the, th the things that we're supposed to be doing actually do counter those 16 isms. Mm -hmm. And I lay it out in the second half of the book and saying, look, you see this, this particular ism, this is how it is countered by doing what we should be doing step by step. Mm -hmm. 
so simple and so, so cool. profound. Yeah, yes, it, yes. you don't have to like Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, it's 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 awesome that there actually is an answer, and it's and it's quite simple. It does seem that there's always this balance, uh, you know, on the pendulum. And what I kind of heard is it doesn't matter what uh, group of of people and, or concept. There's always this tendency of human rebellion. And when they rebel, like you said, they go underground, they get stronger. Mm-hmm. Uh, even when the church is persecuted, there's this natural tendency, tendency to say, you're not going to change who we are, and we're going to grow in numbers. Mm-hmm. And I, we love the acronym KISS. Keep it simple, silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Just keep it simple. Why, yeah. why, why we reinvent the wheel? I thought it was keep it. I thought it was keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, you're right. right. It, you're right. I was just being nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. Homeschool dad. That's a bad word in your house. Yeah, right? that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Daddy said the S word. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's great that I, we appreciate you diving into the book. We were somewhat hesitant and not revealing it and giving it all away and all the good points, but right, because there's plenty there. That is, yeah, it's yeah. a gem. It's awesome. Plenty yeah. to unpack. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, well, keep going. I, I don't yeah. know. Oh, no, no, you're just keeping rolling. I mean, I just know one quote from your book I love. Uh, we live in a society in which the general rule about sex is that there are no rules about sex. You also say the invention of artificial contraception is more shattering than any other invention in human history. I love that. I've never heard that before. I've been saying it all along. Thank you. Please go with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, People don't realize, don't stop to realize that with artificial contraception and then subsequently abortion, which of course is the violent endpoint of contraception, is that we have put into the hands of ordinary men and women some a power that we have never had before, and that is the power to turn on and turn off the baby machine. Mm-hmm. Because remember, the other side of artificial contraception is artificial conception with surrogacy and in vitro fertilization and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, self-insemination and all this kind of artificial conception, we've given ordinary human beings the power to turn on and off the baby machine. Now, this is a revolutionary invention, which is far more, has far more impact than the invention of fire, the invention of agriculture, the invention of, the invention of movable, movable type, all these other great inventions in human history pale in significance to the fact that we have put into our hands the power of making or not making babies. And this, of course, has rippled down into the women's movement. It's rippled down into homosexualism. It's rippled down into transgender. It's rippled down into eventually what I call the abolition of man, quoting C.S. Lewis, Mm -hmm. that we are actually uh, destroying the human race. And if you look at another one of the things I write about a fair bit is the demographic winter. The fact that everybody seems to be ignoring and are focusing on uh, climate change and various other great big crises that the human race is facing. And everybody seems to be ignoring the fact that sperm counts are dropping, the fertility rates are dropping, and the numbers of children are not at replacement level. The number of live births are not at replacement level for our society and have not been at the replacement level for European society for about the last years. It's the same in Japan. It's increasingly the same even in China. And the demographics are that this is going to spread around the rest of the world. So the human race with artificial contraception and abortion is basically committing a long, slow running suicide. Wow. And it's so widespread even in Catholicism. How do we stop it? You're young guys. <laughs> have, okay. Yeah, I, that's true. We're open to life. Praise God. We have okay. 18 kids between the three of us. So <laughs> we're doing our part, Father. <laughs> Beautiful. How have do I we told teach you about others? Have you told you about how I told you? But a parish needs to support this as well. One of the reasons we have so many young families and big families at my parish is because with my headmaster, we have, we've transitioned our school to a classical curriculum, and we've added grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, and we've also added something which has been a game changer. We added something called Faithful Family Scholarships, in which a family pays for their tu- tuition, their kids, and all the rest come free. Oh, that's great. I can see how shocked you are, right? <laughs> well, I was listening. It's like, but okay, we took, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, because we took that step of faith, the headmaster and myself, and the response has been terrific. Of course, big families love it because one of the complaints about big Catholic families is we can't afford Catholic education. We're not affordable for them. 
And so therefore they're enthusiastic. They love our school. They love our parish. Their kids love the school. They love the parish. We have a wonderful family atmosphere. Um, and I'm just really excited by that. Yeah. And finance and financially, it's turned out well. The Lord has blessed it. Mm. We operate the school at about a hundred thousand dollars surplus last year. Wow! wow. How many kids great. do y'all have? Uh, the upcoming year, we'll have an enrollment in our parish school of over two hundred and fifty. Wow! Wow! That's great. So, of course, when we have fundraisers, these families who are so enthusiastic about our school, they roll up their sleeves, they get involved, and we have a big fundraiser, and we we raise a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. There's, absolutely. There's skin in the game, and there's there's inspiration to get that done. Motivation. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, and it's so sorry. I like to brag about that a little bit. Yeah, I would too. Yeah, that's amazing. It's been a real success story. It's 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 not common. So generally, you think about only rich people can take their kids to Catholic schools. Well, I mean, you're talking to three homeschool dads. So I mean, the expense is all on us. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. we, our wives, have also part of a Catholic homeschool group that they run. And the uh, way the the way we work with our homeschoolers is we say to the homeschoolers. We're going to work with you um, in your homeschool so that we, we're going to give, provide you the stuff for the classical curriculum that your kids can transition into our school at sixth grade when homeschooling sometimes gets a bit cha- more challenging. That's awesome. That That's is, super smart right there. That is yeah. cool. So we work with our homeschoolers and say, it's okay if you homeschool. We like homeschoolers. Here's the curriculum, and here's some advice and some guidance to help you all the way through those those primary grades. Wow. So when they get to grade six, they're ready to come in. They've already prepared to come into sixth grade to our middle school. Mm. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Ready to move to South Carolina. It's a battle plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a battle plan. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. All right. We're going to branch out and have a start a school out here for us. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll, we have some facilities. We're eager. We'll help, we'll help, we'll help you with finding good property. Everybody's moving to Greenville, so you better hurry up because the places are going fast. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. Uh, this has been great. School, this has been great. Yeah. Our school actually has a waiting list in for, the, for the year groups this year, so next year. So. Wow. That's and, we're, and we're ready to build a new school building to accommodate everybody. So. Wow. Praise God. Wow. See, this is the hope. You know, I ask you. The if there's question. any big who would like to, who, yeah, who would like to step up. Yeah, there's some cause for hope. Yeah. That's right. And then you have, these, yep. you know. 10 or 11 altar boys at mass and then, yeah. you know, the girls in the choir and yeah, it's just, it's awesome yeah, to hear. Live it's the great. faith and it's contagious. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's simple. That's amazing. Well, Father, where can people find your books? Not just one of them, but all of them. Where, where <laughs> you... Yeah. Uh, they're available on Amazon. And uh, if they don't like Amazon, then come to my website, which is DwightLongenecker.com and they can read my blog. They can be in touch. They can browse my books. Well, that's incredible. Y- w- yeah, we've, yeah, we've got a great group of, of people that, that we enjoy uh, uh, working with and, and, you know, who comment on the show. And, uh, and so I know they're going to enjoy this and enjoy getting to know you. That's one of the things that we've tried to do is, is bring the folks that excite us, you know, yeah. in our faith uh, to those who go to Mass all the time, but they may not hear them on our local Catholic radio or so um and we try to have bold real and solid catholic priests yep. and lay people so thank you for <laughs> fitting yeah, that criteria that's right yeah, yeah. i yeah. feel like we've created a great network of people who we we trust and are like-minded and this has been an awesome experience so but this is i want to encourage you as well because when i came back to the u.s from america from england i had never experienced catholicism in america and one of the things which I find so hopeful is the entre- what I call the entrepreneurial spirit of American Catholicism. People like yourselves who are just lay people, and that's the Vatican II thing, to get the lay people involved, who are just stepping up, starting schools, starting radio stations, starting TV stations, starting colleges, starting podcasts, starting publishing houses, and saying, let's just get on and do something. And yeah. they're, not, they're not relying on the bishops to support them and give them money. They're not relying on the priests to do everything. They're simply getting on and preaching the gospel and living the gospel in a way that I find very exciting. When I go and speak at men's conferences, one of the most exciting aspects of it is the marketplace where, you know, you've been to these places as well. You go around, everybody's got their table set up and their stall set up. <clears throat> and here's a mom and pop who've started printing Catholic t-shirts like the one you're wearing over there. <laughs> yep, yep. Or, yeah. Or there's a young person who says, father, I have a ministry printing Catholic bumper stickers, you know, and they're out there getting a whole range of stuff, which is actually really exciting, really hopeful for the church. Yes. Absolutely. Amen. Praise God for the hope. 
Yep, yep, for sure. Well, thank you for lighting a fire under three uh, homeschool dads. I mean, this was great. I'm, I feel, yeah, Good. I feel hope and joy. Yes, yeah. amen. How about you guys? It, no, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's true, and there's always this. Uh, yeah, this this is what keeps us going, mm-hmm. quite honestly, and and, and talking Good. with you. So it's an inspiration. So we appreciate it. Are you gonna? Do you have any talks coming up or, or anything out uh, at any conferences? Um. I had a stroke in 2020, and so my I'm a I don't have the strength that I had 10 years ago. Yeah. So I'm I'm stepping back from my speaking engagements a bit and, and focusing on what's local. Um, so I'm not going to doing quite as much of that, but I am trying to keep the blog alive and keep that going as much as I can. Well, you obviously recovered very well, mm. um, <laughs> and so that's awesome to see. Uh, congrats on your recovery. That's no, I mean, great. I have to go through COVID <laughs> and a stroke. That's yeesh. yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> You didn't know me before, okay? So you can probably cover it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, well, keep f- writing those books. They're awesome. Please. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Father, thank well, you so thank much you. for being on with us and uh if you ever need anything, uh, reach out. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, and, and Okay. And, and we'd love to support. Well, thank you. Well, th- thank you guys. Better close down now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got some guests here as well, so I better get going. Oh, okay. So, well, right, right, well right. we okay. won't take any more of your time. So thank you again, Father, for being on with us. And in the meantime, be bold. Okay. Be real. Yeah. Be Catholic. God, ble- God, God bless, bless you. Bless.